Thank you for joining. My name is Bill Latka. I'm, uh, I'm, I'll be your host today, and, uh, but you won't see much of me because we're here to see somebody else. But uh, I, uh, Peter Sinclair will join us in just a moment. Um, today, you know, th there's, a, there's a very big thing happening in the legislature. Uh, Peter's got some late breaking news, uh, things that just happened today down in Lansing about these clean energy future bills. Um, and I'll let him uh, totally take you through that. But I just wanted to welcome you, and uh, uh, you know, it's 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 really great that Peter uh, is taking his time out of his busy schedule to share the latest stuff with with y'all because it really is um, it really is an, an important time in our state. Uh, this is a make or break moment for clean energy, and uh, and and everybody that's here on the call can definitely make a difference. Um, uh, so it looks like uh, we're, we're just about ready to go here. And uh, um, I just wanted to let you know that we are going to have a Q&A session at, at the, at the uh, end of the meeting or at, at, of our call today. So if you have questions, there should be a chat down below that you can go ahead and uh, put, um, you can answer, ask questions in the chat. And we will read them off. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of moderate them and have Peter answer questions uh, toward the end. So think of questions as you go. Feel free to go ahead and, and put them in the chat, even during Peter's presentation, as, as they come to mind. And we'll be able to uh, uh, get to them uh, as, we, as we proceed. So uh, let me introduce uh, Peter Sinclair. And uh, Peter, uh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> you, we, uh, we should tell people we got a new system going here that's a little bit different. And so uh, if, I, if I look like I'm confused at any point, uh, that is genuine. <laughs> so it's not, not a put on. Uh, but yeah, we'll make it work. So uh, Peter, why don't you go ahead and uh, just tell us a little bit about you and, um, and, uh, and then you can launch into your presentation. Sure. So. Uh, you know, I, I presented for the NEMIAC group a number of times. Some of you may know that I am a lifelong Michigander. I reside in Midland. Uh, I am a videographer specializing in energy and climate change. Uh, for the last uh, 15 or more years, this has been my uh, full-time preoccupation and uh, I've spent a lot of time, uh, a dozen years, uh, producing a monthly video for the Yale University School of Environment, uh, which I just wrapped a, a few months ago. Uh, I am uh, putting most of my efforts right now into climate solutions like uh, clean, ener clean energy, particularly here in Michigan and the Midwest, and I'm going to talk a lot about that. But what I want to do tonight is, I think, we're, we're kind of wrapping up a, a very eventful summer that for those of us that pay attention to the natural world around us and to the larger climate change issue, I suspect there's got to be a lot of uh, concern and anxiety as there rightfully should be. And uh, a lot of it has to do with some of the very concerning uh, extreme events that we've seen over the summer, not just here in Michigan, but around the world and continue to see. Many of you know that we're, uh, we're just moving into a so-called El Nino year, which is uh, uh, a long-term cycle that happens in the Pacific Ocean, but it's very consequential for the rest of the planet and a lot of heat that has been being stored in the ocean over the last few years is now coming out and it's resulting in a whole lot of uh, pretty eye-popping uh, air temperature graphs like uh, this one which is uh, this is from the European Center for Weather Forecasting um, and these are uh, uh, September global temperatures uh, anomalies meaning is it above or below uh, an average? And uh, what's most uh, eye-popping right now is what's happening in this month, uh, this just past month of September 2023, when we saw this uh, uh, rather amazing uh, jump 
in global temperatures and that a lot of people have been talking about. In fact, uh, one of my scientist friends referred to this as absolutely gobsmackingly bananas. And his comments, because he's pretty well known, went viral. And so I've spent some time uh, tracking down uh, a little bit about what this is telling us and talking to, uh, spoke to one of my good uh, friends, uh, Andrew Dessler at Texas A&M last week, and I'll be sharing some of his comments. Um, this is, uh, the gobsmackingly bananas guy is uh, Zeke Hausfather, and he administers something called the Berkeley Earth Global Temperatures. And their own graph came out just today for September. Again, this is September temperatures. This is average temperatures for September's going back to like about 1848, I think, in their uh, data set. And you can see that this September is pretty off the chart. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that really has a lot of people concerned as to what the heck is going on here. Uh, and um, so I, uh, I'm gonna show a video here. I, I took uh, a couple clips of uh, scientists that I know pretty well, Kevin Trenberth and Peter Glick, and also, uh, Dr. Dessler, and uh, I, I, I have just cut them together here so that you can hear a spread of, of reactions to uh, uh, this record that we've just seen. Uh, so Bill, just go ahead and play that. It's not you know, surprising that a month or even a couple of months breaks the previous record by a small amount, but we expect that those records are broken by a tenth of a degree Celsius, not half a degree Celsius, that's just happened in this past uh, September. I mean, that's just a remarkable jump. September temperature data are mind blowing. They're beyond anything that climate scientists have expected to see at this point. Dr. Peter Glick is a climate scientist with the Pacific Institute in Berkeley. He says while the strong El Nino now developing does play a role. But it cannot account for the magnitude of the increase we've seen, not just in September, these astounding September temperatures, but, but North America experienced its hottest summer on record, June, July, August. It's been a relentless series of high temperatures. You can make the argument like, you know, this suggests that there's something different going on. We're entering an acceleration not predicted by the models. Um, I've yet to be convinced that that's true. Um, and so, but, you know, I'm open to the possibility, but I think the null hypothesis is that the predictions you see from the models are probably right because that's what they've been doing. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, some of the climate models. And I apologize for all these graphs. It's going to get better. There's going to be more video, but just bear with me here because uh, this will help us understand what's going on. Uh, the blue jagged area that you see there is the, uh, a whole bunch of climate models that have been run uh, by one of the leading groups. And, and they're looking backwards in time to the late 70s and forwards in time to uh, about 2050, just using the best physics that we have and estimating what the global uh, temperatures are, average is gonna be. And so the, the blue area is sort of like a whole bunch, you know, dozens if not hundreds of model runs and then the black line is kind of the mean or average of what all of those models are showing. And then the red is uh, actual global temperature measurements. And this is where we are now. And you can see that that line is it's up. It's at the high end of what any of those models would have predicted. Uh, but you can also see that we've been in other places in other years over past decades where we've pushed up to and even above those model projections uh, several times. So typically this happens during an El Nino event. Uh, it's happening a little bit earlier in the cycle this time. So, uh, you know, stay tuned. Let's see what happens. But uh, we're not 
we're not flying completely off the chart yet in terms of you know global annual uh, temperature. So it's important to understand, and this graph is a good example. The the models have done a really good job so far for the last 50 years of of projecting what global temperature is going to do. Uh, what where we may have lost, uh, where, where, where modelers may have lost track a little bit is how much of an effect or what kind of extreme events can be triggered by these predicted temperature rises. In other words, the, the temperature rise is pretty steady over time, but we're starting to see uh, effects from that temperature rise that are much more severe than what we would have predicted uh, just 20 years ago. Uh, here's, uh, again, going back to the gob gobsmackingly bananas scientist, uh, Zeke Housefather. This is his, uh, his group's prediction for what, uh, where we'll end up as an average for 2023 uh that uh that green line is sort of the likely range of where they think uh at, at the end of the year when they sum it all up in january that's where they think will be so it's it you know looks like pretty much in range but again the concern is uh what kind of effects are we seeing from this predicted temperature rise and so we've been seeing a lot of extreme events this past summer that have, I think, uh, freaked a lot of people out. Um, you may have noticed, uh, I certainly did in May and June, that we went for weeks there where we were choking on air from wildfire uh, emissions from Canada. And Canada has been seeing record wildfire uh, activity. And just to show you how much of a record that is, uh you see all those gray lines uh uh those are each one of those lines is a different year from 2003 to 2022 of daily wildfire carbon emissions in canada so that goes up to 20, 2022 so this is where we are in 2023 so we're we're seeing events like this that are way above the kind of impacts that scientists would have expected. They seem way out of line. And so we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, uh, this phenomenon of while temperatures are going up at a predicted rate, the impacts seem to be accumulating at an accelerating pace. And so this video will be a little discussion, just very short, uh, of Andrew Dessler and uh, Bill McKibben, uh, the writer Bill McKibben, uh, sort of reacting to this idea. Go ahead and play that, Bill. If there is a place where I would say we are missing the boat, it's on the implications of 1.2, 1.3 degrees Celsius of warming. I think those are far worse than the economists and everyone else was looking at climate impacts. We probably, it appears, dramatically underestimated how much change comes with two or three degrees rise in temperature. Uh, the kind of things we're seeing now are the kind of things that when I was writing The End of Nature in 1989, we were expecting for the end of this century. Uh, here's a... Uh, uh, webcam from the Mackinac Bridge on June 27th. And uh, so what the kind of changes that uh, Dr. Dessler and Phil McKibben were talking about there were uh, things like the wildfires that we just saw, uh, but also things like uh, the loss of Arctic sea ice, which is proceeding much faster than anybody would have thought 20 years ago. The melting of uh, mountain glaciers uh, which is uh, which is accelerating rapidly. The melting of uh, ice caps, land ice, like on Greenland and Antarctica, 
which is um, moving faster uh, by, uh, by a long shot than people would have imagined 20 years ago. And so uh, what, what these impacts also show us uh, as, as we look at this picture of Mackinac Bridge, which most Michiganders tend to think of as kind of the gateway to God's country, and yet here it is uh, shrouded in choking toxic smoke. Uh, many of us have perhaps hoped or imagined that uh, living here in Michigan, that we would be in some kind of a, a climate haven or a place where climate impacts would not be uh, so severe, that we would be somehow protected or shielded uh, from some of those impacts. But uh, part of my theme tonight is that uh, there are no climate havens. Uh, climate change is going to be hitting everybody. And uh, I'm going to suggest a couple of uh, mechanisms that maybe folks might not have thought of uh, tonight. Um, recent article in Bridge Magazine talked about uh, the, the cold, clear water that we're used to fishing in, swimming in, recreating in here in Michigan, and that we treasure so much. Uh, in the warming Great Lakes, we're going to have to accept that some of this may not be able to keep the same character and quality that we're used to uh, as climate change pushes the Great Lakes region's cold water lakes and rivers to a breaking point. There simply isn't enough capacity, time, and money to save them all. Uh, by mid-century, more than half of Michigan's 300 high-quality cold water lakes will no longer be categorized as such. Uh, the list of places at risk of warming includes some familiar names like Higgins, Charlevoix, Torch, and Crystal Lakes, along with trout streams across the state. And just reading those names, it just pierces my heart as a, as a lifelong Michigander because these are all places that I have grown up on and, and loved uh, with, with just the, the depths of my heart. So I, uh, these, are, these are hard, hard things to hear, but I, I, I'm trying to convey to you the, the, the immediacy of uh, the, the threats that we're facing. They are not far away. They're not in the Arctic or in the developing world. They're right here in front of us with places that we know and we love. Now, these, the northern, the central, northern, the Great Lakes uh, areas of the United States are often spoken of as a, a climate haven. Uh, this graph comes from an article by Julie Arbit, Brad Bottoms, and Earl Lewis at the University of Michigan. And they point out that uh, these purported climate, climate havens are in states with some of the highest projected temperature rises uh, between now and mid-century. So our temperatures are rising faster and our uh, impacts are rising faster because while uh, uh, one of our greatest strengths here in Michigan uh, as a buffer against climate change is that we have a lot of water. It turns out that one of our greatest vulnerabilities uh, here in Michigan and the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes states, is precisely because we have a lot of water. And uh, climate affects the hydrological cycles, which means we're seeing more extreme storms, uh, more extreme precipitation events. Uh, about a year ago, PBS had a special on about climate change, and they suggested that there that uh, one place one might go. What they, the question they posed was, what is the place I can go to be safe from the ravages of climate change? And the answer that the program came up with was Northern Vermont. Uh, but if you were paying attention to the news back in June and July, you saw that Northern Vermont and upstate New York were hit what, by a series of storms, uh, unprecedented rainstorms that were uh, that left uh, the capital of Vermont uh, underwater, and a number of those small communities uh, nestled into river valleys between mountains, uh, uh, flooded and damaged in a way that uh, 
many folks up there were not prepared for and really couldn't imagine. Uh, so uh, in 2023 alone, these Haven regions have been suffering significant damages from powerful storms and floodings. Uh, we're also in a part of the country where uh, uh, electrical grid infrastructure is uh, old, aging, uh, and uh, subject to failure. Michigan is uh, 45, number 45 among states in terms of our electric reliability. So we got a lot of blackouts and brownouts due to uh, failures of, of the grid, which are often precipitated by extreme weather events. And so um, uh, this is something that people are going to have to think about if, if indeed these states are going to be a climate haven, is that we've got aging infrastructure that has to be addressed. Uh, heavy rainfall and extreme winter storms can cause widespread damage to the grid, and that, uh, and as well as significant flood flooding and heighten the risk of waterborne disease outbreaks, and these effects are particularly noticeable in the leg legacy Great Lakes cities because of the aging infrastructure. Uh, and we see that precipitation is going up because warm air holds more water. Uh, that's just uh, high school physics. And what we see from this map, uh, the dark green areas, you can see that Michigan is one of the states with a, the greatest increase in total precipitation and more and more of that precipitation is coming in uh, large heavy precipitation events. Uh, those of you that are uh, uh, certainly over age 40, you'll probably agree with me that uh, the types of rainstorms that we've been experiencing in the last decade or so uh, have been more often much heavier than we can remember from the past and the statistics bear that out uh, when i watch the news I, and and watch with a sort of climate change in uh in mind uh it, it really speaks volumes uh this report from channel 7 in detroit wxyz uh was on august 25th on august 25th uh following sort of the cleanup of a massive storm that came through and spawned something like seven, maybe more than seven tornadoes uh, across Southeast Michigan. And these are folks in, uh, I believe it's Macomb County uh, doing some cleanup work. So uh, Bill, go ahead and, and play that one. That's Mark Rodolfo, who's lived in this neighborhood since 1997. He helped a woman move her car off his street the second time, he says, it's flooded in just four weeks. We thought after the first time somebody would address it, but I don't think it's been addressed. I don't even think it's been looked at. When you're looking at this car going through the water, I mean, what's going through your mind? That they should use a kayak. I don't... His daughter, Jennifer Rodolfo, says she's been calling the township and county today, hoping to get answers as to why their streets are the ones underwater. From Chopper 7, it almost looks like the homes are on canals instead of streets. The homeowners growing frustrated. It's not the first time. I'm getting tired of it. We got a lot of rain over a very short period of time. Macomb County Emergency Manager Brandon Lewis says streets in Harrison and Clinton Townships also flooded. But this neighborhood appears to be one of the hardest hit. While neighbors have concerns about the drainage, he says it's likely due to an abnormal amount of rain. It's not really a significant infrastructure issue. The infrastructure is working. What you're getting is just a significant rainfall that we're not used to seeing. And it's just taking that infrastructure time to clear that water out. It's just everywhere. The water is everywhere. Yeah, so it's uh, it's always interesting to listen to these news reports because the, the journalists most often do not put events like this in any kind of a climate context, although uh, you the story just jumps out at you when you're uh, listening with that in mind. Uh, following on social media, we saw an awful lot of uh, these kind of reactions following that flooding. Uh, I've never seen anything like this. And indeed, uh, that's that's the case of what we're we're seeing. We're moving into a uh, a new uh, condition in a, a, a world where climate has changed. It's not changing, it has changed and continues to change. And uh, 
there is no really new normal. The new normal is no normal. It's going to continue to change until we uh, stop uh, adding more heat trapping gases to the atmosphere. So uh, looking at all those homes uh, in that previous TV report, you have to ask yourself, okay, they, these folks are saying this keeps happening. Uh, it means that many of those homes are experiencing some damage. Uh, the way we deal with these kind of extreme events is that we have insurance. But uh, as more and more climate events, uh, climate driven extreme events keep happening, there is more and more burden on that insurance infrastructure. You know, we're, we, we think about climate change as, uh, you know, maybe if you saw that movie, uh, The Day After Tomorrow, uh, the giant wave hitting New York, or you think about, you know, some kind of dramatic change in the uh, circulation of the Atlantic or the breakup of uh, Arctic ice or collapse of Antarctic uh, ice sheets. Uh, something as humble as as home insurance might not pop immediately to your mind, but this is a huge, huge uh, impact that could uh, that could be something that that uh, strikes our economy uh, suddenly because uh, the the big sudden changes that scientists have been most worried about are not uh some kind of uh you know wave washing manhattan away it's more like what happens when human systems including economic systems get overwhelmed by just uh the steady steady uh uh upward uh climb of these dramatic uh expensive climate impacting events so, Bill, uh, why don't you play this uh, video? It's kind of a, a mashup of some news reports plus Dr. Dessler. Tonight, the cost of insuring a home in California could soon dramatically change. For the first time, the state's insurance commissioner is moving to let insurance companies factor in future climate risks when setting new policy prices. We are truly living in unprecedented times. After decades of disaster, Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lora says the move is aimed at keeping insurance companies from fleeing the state and homeowners insured. There's no doubt that California is at an insurance crossroads. Making, Calif making insurance more available is becoming critical for our entire economy. John Eck, a VEC agency, says he's seen homeowners insurance rate increases of up to 15 percent this year. The insurance companies pay out money for those disasters in Florida and California, big hailstorms in Texas. It's going to affect the rates here in Kansas. You know, insurance is the best example I think we have right now where you see these insurance companies that are pulling out of places like Florida and Louisiana and California uh, because they can't charge enough to cover the risk. You know, insurance company has to charge high enough premiums so that when something bad happens, they can pay out. You know, if there's a 10% chance every year a house is gonna be destroyed, your premium has to be 10% of the value of the house. And, um, and, and so they have to be able to charge those premiums. And, and then they run into the political problem, which is, People can't afford it and policymakers don't, you know, that makes constituents unhappy. So policymakers go in there and they put limits on what the insurance companies can charge. And so then the insurance companies just leave. State Farm joins AIG, leaving California's homeowners insurance market. Now, your options getting your home covered are even fewer. With a new study projecting more than 39 million Americans could soon face skyrocketing insurance premiums, some insurers have already walked away from hurricane and flooding prone states like Florida and Louisiana. In high risk areas of California, many are already priced out. Just received the bill and it's double what it was last year. Once you lose insurance, uh, the whole economy falls apart. You know, our, our economy runs on insurance. Can't get a mortgage without insurance. Um, you know, businesses can't operate without insurance. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's the fundamental problem is the, the risk 
of damage has gotten really high. And when the risk of damage get, you know, the, you can think of the risk as kind of your expected damage every year. And if your expected damage every year is 10% of the value of your house, uh, you know, people can't afford that. You know, if you live a $300,000 house, that's $30,000 a year is your expected damage. Now, you don't get that every year, but every 10 years, you might get $300,000. So, you know, it, it's a, it, so what, what's, this is the cost of climate change. I think this is where the economists have really failed. You know, they haven't taken these kinds of factors into account. Um, yeah, they haven't looked at how, you know, day to day, these costs are really accumulating. So uh, I hope what you picked up on in there was uh, the uh, the report from the Wichita, Kansas uh, TV station talking to the local insurance agent there who pointed out that uh, uh, extreme events in places like uh, California, Texas, and Florida were impacting insurance companies and particularly reinsurance companies, which are the insurance companies that insurance companies go to to get insurance. Uh, these companies are having to raise their rates. And that's, this means that all of us are going to have to pay and uh, uh, see our, our own costs go up, even in places like Michigan. But the, uh, the storm impacts that we saw in that television report as they keep uh, happening more and more here in places like Michigan, we're not that far removed from uh, the, the kind of pressure that folks in Florida and California and Texas are seeing. Uh, about two years ago, actually, I, uh, I got an email just unprompted from a local uh, insurance agent here in my area, a very conservative guy, uh, active in the Republican Party, well known in the community, uh, reached out to me out of the blue and said he he wanted to have coffee and, and learn more about climate change because he was starting to see some of these things uh, crop up in the, uh, the meetings that he was going to, the journals that he was reading, and the policies that he was writing. And just a few weeks ago, uh, I had an exchange with him. I, I've been continuing to share information with him. And he responded to me just a few weeks ago. In my 30 years, I have never seen anything like what is happening right now. I sit on several different advisory boards and insurance companies are scared to death about the trends they are seeing. You're correct. It's not just coastal areas either which by the way, are nearly impossible to insure right now. I had two houses last week in Hilton Head where the premium went from 12,000 to over 30,000 and they were lucky to get the 30,000. Imagine that, 30,000 a year. Uh, and he said, there's nothing else on the market. So, uh, so this is starting to uh, make inroads uh, in the consciousness of even people who maybe haven't been terribly concerned about environmental trends, but they're starting to see it, uh, you know, in, in areas where maybe we, we might not have expected. So I want to talk about the challenge and, and what we can do. Uh, people always at the end of these talks want to know what we can do. And uh, if you're on this call, you're probably someone that's doing things and is an activist already. Uh, if you're not, uh, now would be a really good time to jump in. Uh, if you've been wondering uh, what your uh, life's calling is, I would say that planet Earth is calling us all uh, right now. And uh, the challenge is rather uh, daunting. So this is a graph from Glenn Peters, who is a, a data scientist uh, based in Norway. And this is global carbon dioxide emissions, uh, emissions over since 1900. 
and uh, to if we are going to try to limit global warming to one and a half degrees centigrade or less, or at least have a 50% chance of doing that by 2050, uh, this is what we're going to have to do with global CO2 emissions. It's pretty daunting, and and I should say that uh, you know he made this graph in 2019, and so he just recently extended it out to 2023. We're not we're not really heading down that slope yet, so that slope is getting even steeper. And uh, I guess if you thought of that as a ski slope, uh, that would be a, a triple black diamond. Uh, you know, pretty challenging, uh, pretty daunting. But that's the task. Uh, we have to we have to begin doing that, and we're not doing all of that great a job. Uh, here in Michigan, we've got a number of uh, of barriers, and uh, the one I'm going to talk about is that the fossil fuel industry has recognized that the cat's out of the bag as far as climate change. Uh, People now get it, particularly young people, are really upset about climate change. Uh, the politics is starting to uh, to turn on them a little bit. Uh, but so what they are starting to do is push back against uh, clean energy, the clean energy transition that's happening. So here's the different generation sources, and we're just talking about electrical generation. Uh, there's, there's other things to talk about, but we'll focus on that. So you can see all these lines here. Sorry, I'm back to some graphs. But the big black line at the top, that shows coal generation as a, a percentage of electrical generation since 1970. Uh, it's kind of on the downward trend globally. Uh, the gray line is natural gas, which has been kind of moving upward, but sort of flattened out in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, hydro is the blue line. Uh, that is kind of coming down as a percentage. Uh, there are some concerns about hydro because of the increased incidence of severe droughts, which is impacting places that have a lot of hydro uh, uh, dependence, uh, China being one. Uh, that uh, nuclear, there's a red line that you can see is kind of coming down, although people are talking about kind of trying to jumpstart nuclear. Uh, that might happen, but we don't expect to see it in, in uh, a big way, uh, even under the uh, most optimistic projections until 2030-ish time frame. Uh, the, the green line is uh, renewables, uh, non-hydro renewables, so solar and wind primarily. And so those are really trending up robustly. And that's good, and we want to see that. And if we break that down, we can see that here's uh, uh, solar uh, residential heat pumps, which is a very uh, a good way uh, to uh, substitute electricity for gas and, and heating your, your home, your business, uh, sales of electric cars, of battery storage, all going up uh, in, in these really strong curves. Uh, we can talk more about, you know, the, the sociology of S-curves, but once, once curves start moving like this, uh, you are into a uh, global transformation that's pretty unstoppable and is going to happen pretty quickly. Uh, but we need it to happen quickly because uh, the, the bottom line is uh, uh, if we look at electrical generation globally for wind and solar, it's going up, it's continuing to go up, but it is still only at about uh, 13 to 15% globally. And we need to do one heck of a lot better than that uh, fast, uh, especially if we're going to be electrifying transportation, we're going to be electrifying our heating and cooling and industrial heat and everything else. Uh, we need to move fast. But this is where the fossil fuel industry is throwing up roadblocks. And they are using uh, uh, a far-flung social media misinformation campaign uh, 
uh, coordinated by fossil fuel uh, funded organizations. We have one here in, in Midland called the Mackinac Center, but uh, they have them in every state and every big city. Uh, and uh, there are young kids, 22, 23 year old kids in these uh, organizations that do nothing but spend all day on social media uh, spreading uh, misinformation and disinformation, uh, anger, grievance, and fear uh, directed at clean energy. And uh, some of you may have seen some of the, the videos that I have done, interviews with uh, farmers uh, across the state, but I'm going to focus on Montcalm County here. Montcalm County is in central uh, sort of uh, west central Michigan, uh, north of Grand Rapids. Uh, it's quite rural, uh, very conservative, very Republican, very Trumpy, uh, and uh, it's an area where a lot of farmers would like to site clean energy on their land, but they're being blocked by this uh, concerted uh, campaign that uh, mobilizes uh, uh, aggrieved, angry people to show up at township meetings and uh, and demonstrate against uh, any clean energy development in their local area. And it looks a lot like uh, if you've seen the videos of people that want to burn books and people that have conspiracy theories about vaccines and people that uh, think librarians are out to get them and teachers are out to get them. Uh, it looks very much like that and it's playing out across rural America and it's had a very chilling effect on the rollout of clean energy, solar and wind. Uh, so I'm going to uh, show you, this is about a seven or eight minute video and I'll just preface this by saying what struck me in interviewing these farmers is uh, the similarity of the stories they were telling me to the stories I was hearing from climate scientists 15 years ago. 15 years ago, climate scientists were the targets of the fossil fuel industry's attack, uh, trying to uh, discredit them, trying to intimidate them, trying to threaten them so that they would perhaps uh, shut up and back down and, and stop their work. Uh, the fossil fuel industry recognized that it has lost that scientific uh, battle, but now it's ported the same tactics to try to block clean energy and, and so is targeting, instead of scientists, they're targeting the people who could be the hosts for that clean energy in rural America, primarily farmers. And so some of the same groups that I was aware of when I was uh, defending climate scientists are now the very same groups that are now attacking farmers and landowners. So I'll just play this so you can get a, uh, an idea of how that goes. Go ahead and, and run that, Bill. And before we do this, uh, Peter, I just want to add a programming note. Um, I'd like to, if you have questions, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window. Let's use that for questions. Uh, somebody pointed out to me that the, the, the chat is disabled. So uh, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A button. And here comes the video. There are these organizers that come in um, that are totally invested in the destruction of wind and solar and the destruction of local communities that might support it. It's almost like a, it's almost like a cult type deal is what it looks like to me. If, if you're an anti-wind person, whoever's behind this, you believe everything they say and nothing that anybody else has to say. And anything they say goes and nothing can be said bad about them. But there's someone out there, I think, that a little bit higher up than what our county is uh, coaching these people. So a lot of the stuff that they ask, you add, like, Where'd you hear that from? Or how do you know that? Or, you know, they're being coached. People you thought had a lot of common sense, whoever the big cheese is, that's who they believe. 
<laughs> you, you have any idea who the big cheese is? Well, well, we heard right from the start that there was Kevin Martis. You had people like Kevin Martis. Kevin Martis. A few names that I've had dropped would be Kevin Martis. One of the fossil fuel industry's key messengers in middle America is Kevin Martis, who has inserted himself in community conversations across the heartland. I'm also a senior policy fellow at E&E Legal Institute. E&E Legal is a Washington, D.C.-based lobbying firm which receives funding from the fossil fuel industry. In 2012, E&E's predecessor organization invited right-wing activists from across America to a special training session aimed at opposing clean energy projects. Among the attendees, Kevin Martis, who described himself as a real estate investor and contractor from Blissfield, Michigan, enlisted among his goals seeking funding to lobby in the Michigan capital. e and &E Legal is well known over the past decade for a campaign of harassment, intimidation, and bullying against scientists and academics around the United States, including NASA atmospheric physicist James Hansen, and Malcolm Hughes of the University of Arizona. I, I think psychologically it has a somewhat similar effect uh, to living in a police state. For his part, Mr. Martis denies receiving any compensation from the fossil fuel industry for his decade of extensive travel, testimony, social media advocacy, and public presentations. In fact, those who question Mr. Martis's credentials or motivations often receive threats of legal retaliation from an elite Detroit law firm. Recently, in a Facebook posting, Mr. Martis laid out E&E &E Legal's recipe for fossil fuel advocates who wish to influence or intimidate local, township, or county officials. He writes, your county commissioners will not be moved by facts. They will be moved by political fear. If your plan for success involves urging the county government to take steps that require some blend of courage and intelligence, you will lose. He goes on to emphasize fear as the most important tactic. Over the past two years, that philosophy of fear and intimidation has been deployed in Montcalm County, Michigan, in an attempt to block clean energy projects, both wind and solar. When people come up and poke their finger in your chest and that we have people come drive in our driveway um, and yell and scream at us. Did you ever feel personally threatened or? Uh... I, I did. Our township officials were threatened. There is still fear within our community. Time and again, when Mr. Martis becomes involved, formerly low key meetings become settings for anger and division. In case after case, Mr. Martis's involvement in a community correlates with disrespect, disorder, and disruption. How about then just shut the hell up? Yeah. It was right. James originally. Yeah. Right. 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 I'll, 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 I'll call, call him Eddie. Please. Yeah. Please do. We've had vandalism at the town hall. We've had vandalism to our sign. During this meeting, outbursts of any remarks will not be tolerated, and threats to township official, officials will be prosecuted. This year, letter that states to me, and then he says, then you must be one stupid blank idiot in the world, or you're just a stupid blank farmer. He's a liar and a cheater, and he blanks everyone over. When people that you knew, friends and neighbors, turn into like a cult type situation. And maybe, I, maybe I'm not gonna say that I'm 100% right, but it was very, very strange. In Montcalm County, Mr. Martis's followers adapted language with almost a religious tone. He has no morals. He doesn't have a soul. There's one gal that, that I won't mention her name, but she lives off to the east of us, who has stated in writing, whenever she sees a wind turbine, she thinks of the apocalypse and the end of the world. But I think the one over the top was when one of the men was, was a friend of ours. It stood up and said, you're all going to hell. And I'm you know, uh, it, you know, it just all, what do you say to that? You know, because we don't agree on a subject, you know, um, no. More than one local official described an anti-clean energy rally with the trappings of a revival meeting. 
almost tent revivals where people would come in and sing and ask for donations and cry and weep and gnash their teeth. It, it was like a pep rally that they were having and there was a, a man there that was really encouraging them and this is what you need to go and do and this is, you know, you need to hoop and holler. And Some of those churches you go in and you know you're you're praising like that's what it was let's praise i mean they put these people like kevin martis on this pedestal literally it felt like being at a church and you're like hallelujah literally i mean that's why it felt so cultish people just i mean in tears and and i just i'm like how am i the only one that's seeing this and thinking this is crazy Sharing the stage with Mr. Martis at the Trufant rally was Michigan gubernatorial candidate Ryan Kelly. Wind energy is an absolute joke. Mr. Kelly gained notoriety a few months later after being arrested by the FBI and charged for his participation in the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Seven months before the January 6th event, on his Facebook page, Mr. Martis posted this picture of a burned-out truck damaged in an anti-wind protest in Australia. Martis wrote, I don't condone this at all, but I have warned state legislators that the true cost of 40, 50, or 60 percent wind generation in any given state must include the cost of a new capital building because folks won't take it and will resort to extreme actions. That same month, armed demonstrators entered the Michigan Capitol building in Lansing, angry, they said, because of public health measures related to COVID-19. The New York Times later called it a dress rehearsal for the January 6th attack on democracy and the electoral process. A transition to carbon-free energy is vital to preserve a livable planet for future generations. But a coordinated misinformation campaign about climate change has evolved into an attack on clean energy technologies, using misinformation, but also intimidation, harassment, and fear. The polls in the state of Michigan show two-thirds of the population is in favor of renewable energy. It's just this very vocal, very militant, anti-groups that don't want it anywhere near them. Those people don't have good intentions and those people have a certain agenda. Those people come into these rural communities and tear them apart and leave. That's real. It requires a cult of personality behind some of these people that push this narrative so hard and are so invested in the destruction of, of wind turbines and the destruction of solar and the destruction of anyone, whether it's a farmer or a politician, who believes in them. So uh, just to underline uh, what uh, you heard the farmer Jen Wel Jed Welder saying there, uh, recent polling data shows that 73% of Michiganders support increasing the share of electricity from renewable sources, 67% uh, support the My Healthy Climate Plan, which is, uh, I believe, Governor Whitmer's uh, uh, energy plan. 61% uh, of Michiganders support moving Michigan to 100% clean energy, including 60% of independents. So the problem that we're seeing, which is uh, keeping this from happening, is that the permitting process takes, shape, takes place at local township boards, which are overwhelmed with the complexity of $300 million projects. Uh, these are boards of, uh, you know, essentially volunteers who, for the most part, over decades, uh, seldom have to uh, deal with anything more complex than do we have enough porta potties for the uh, softball tournament. And they're being asked to uh, make judgments on uh, $100 million engineering projects that they have no background in. Uh, and they're under attack 
but with threats and harassment, even physical threats, uh, by these conspiracy-driven flash mobs. Uh, many of these local officials that I've talked to would like to see uh, the state take a larger role in this to take some of the pressure off them and to uh, give enough uh, technical support so that these projects can be adequately evaluated. Uh, today, uh, Representative Abraham Ayash uh, introduced a suite of bills, uh, House Bills 5120, to 5123, so it's a total of four bills, 20, 21, 22, 23, uh, that would uh, in total uh, grant more authority to the Michigan Public Service Commission to review uh, and approve these kind of applications, just as they currently do for things like transmission lines and pipelines and things of that nature. So it basically would just uh, uh, allow this very professional uh, state-backed group, which has uh, more than a hundred uh, very technically proficient experts uh, who would be able to bring their expertise to uh, uh, these siting issues and streamline this process and, and uh, move a lot of these projects that have been stalled and held up. Um, the pushback that we are already hearing, and this is very, very well organized and so uh, your representatives and senators are, are being absolutely bombarded right now with uh, 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 resolutions and messages from, uh, from all over the state. And much of this organized by Mr. Martis and his, uh, and his uh, organization, uh, pushing back on the idea that we have to preserve local control. And local control is certainly something that's very important at the county and township level. And it's something that uh, it kind of makes sense. But if we if we look at it uh, historically, what we see is that uh, over the last decade, um, for instance, in 2016-2017 uh, time frame, the uh, legislature got wind that several communities uh, around the state were thinking of initiating uh, bans of single-use plastic bags. They just uh, a local uh, legislative action to ban single-use plastic. Uh, they immediately acted and uh, uh, pushed through what's called the plastic bag ban ban laws uh, that uh, take state control away from local communities uh, in any instances related to plastic bags uh, which is a high priority for the petrochemical industry. Uh, another example would be uh, when Governor Snyder signed in uh, that similar time frame, 2015, 2016, the so-called Death Star legislation, which prohibited local communities from setting uh, a local, uh, for instance, minimum wage or paid sick days for local businesses or instituting requirements for uh, union participation in uh, local infrastructure jobs. So uh, there has been no consistent principle of respect for local control uh, from the legislature. What there has been is consistently a, an obedience and a loyalty to big business uh, and the fossil fuel and petrochemical industry. Uh, and that is uh, that is where we're going to see a lot of the uh, the pushback uh, coming from on uh, 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 measures to expedite the siting of clean energy. So, uh, Bill, I think I gave you a, a link. I sent you a link to put in the chat. Uh, this would take people to a page where they can uh, write a message to the House Energy Committee and urge them to give the Public Service Commission the authority to review and approve applications for uh, wind, solar, and energy storage project projects throughout the state. Uh, so I would urge everybody on this call to, uh, to copy that link, uh, go there, and, and begin that process. And then uh, also think about calling, uh, emailing, or snail mailing uh, your local representative uh, local newspapers, uh, 
attending local meetings, uh, becoming active uh, in your community and your county when uh, you hear about clean energy projects uh, that are uh, uh, being proposed. Uh, you have to go out and you have to uh, show up and be the, uh, the well-informed and measured and respectful adult in the room. And if you do that, you will, uh, you will get a lot of appreciation from some of these local boards who are under so much pressure. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up here with, you know, sort of a toolkit for uh, activists. I've, I've presented this before and a lot of people have asked me for it, so I'll, I'll go through it again. Uh, you should be looking at your information diet as critically and as crucially as you look at your actual uh, food diet. Uh, your information diet should include number one, fiber. Uh, that would be information from primary sources, sources like NOAA, NASA, uh, our major universities, professional journals, professional news organizations with a real editorial process. Uh, when I make a salad, I'm looking for diverse colors. Uh, that means uh, in, the, in news, you're looking for diverse, uh, qualified, uh, respectable sources. Uh, to get your information so that you can compare and contrast and, and this can help you uh, get a better idea of, of which things are uh, most likely to be to be true versus misinformation. Uh, local, I, I go to my farmer's market to buy food. I also uh, have a subscription to my local newspaper and I, uh, I uh, do things like uh, call in or appear on a local uh, talk radio and uh, interact with people that way. And uh, local, local Facebook groups, local uh, citizens groups, uh, get involved in, uh, in local uh, groups of people who are trying to make positive change. Uh, when you're reading news, read the label. Who wrote it? When? A lot of information should come with expiration dates. I've uh, often made the mistake of assuming that uh, some item that's floating around on the web is, is current when in fact it's 15 years old. And a lot of the misinformation that you see comes from uh, people passing around articles from 2005 or 2008 uh, as if it's current. Uh, and trusted vendors, uh, I know which uh, which Grocery stores are, will have the best uh, best product. I know which vendors at the farmer's market are the ones I like to go to. Uh, professional news sources versus uh, your cousin Fuzzy on Facebook. Uh, cousin Fuzzy may be a good guy, but uh, might not always have the inside uh, dope on the latest conspiracy theory. So, uh, I would urge you to do that. Uh, we'll, we'll go to Q&A here. I don't know how much time is left, but I'll just leave you with uh, some, some good online resources. Uh, I have uh, resource websites for wind and solar, wind101.info, sun101.org. Uh, my own blog, uh, which I post on a daily, uh, is uh, I think has a sense of urgency, but is a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, so you get a little bit of, of relief but I have a very strong following among the scientific and journalistic community. Uh, and I'd love to have you uh, jump in. Uh, we have a lot of animated uh, discussions there. Uh, I'm still on Twitter. Uh, some of us are, have decided to try to fight it out on Twitter uh, because uh, uh, otherwise it becomes a complete wasteland, um, but we're taking it day by day at Peter W. Sinclair. And finally, if you want to go for uh, rock bottom, uh, solid climate information, climate.nasa.gov is a great place to start. So I will leave that there. Uh, I guess we'll see if, uh, if there's any questions or Q&A or any follow-up that anybody would like to have. Uh, I'd, I'd certainly, uh, certainly be happy to hear it. So yeah, please go ahead and, uh, and we only have a few questions in the Q&A, but if you have any, now's the time to put them in there. Uh, let me just bring up the... Oops. Oops. Bill, I lost your audio. I'm sorry. 
Oh, okay, there it is. Okay, so oh, there um, it is. Yeah, got it. This will be just a, a bit of a trick question because uh, this was asked early on. Um, there was a uh, well, I guess I lost it. Um, uh, there was a question about uh, uh, metrics on a Twitter post earlier on. Uh, there was a you there was a uh, something that you mentioned about a Twitter uh, post and uh, way back in the beginning of your presentation. So maybe that's too bit of a, a trick question because I don't remember the context. Uh, yeah, I guess I, 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 I would need more more uh, background on that. Okay, all right. Um, uh, Mo asked, uh, she is a, uh, she's on the planning commission in Corwith County uh, and climate change is not a priority there. She asks, she needs some practical steps to take that could move her community, which is Vanderbilt and township in this direction. Well, if you're on the planning commission, that's you've taken a huge step. Uh, you know, uh, in in a, a small a small community like Vanderbilt uh, in northern Michigan, uh, you're trying to uh, to draw people uh, who would be driving by on the freeway, uh, perhaps to stop in and do a little business in your town. Uh, how about suggesting uh, trying to find uh, uh, someone that will come in and, and set up uh, uh, an EV charging station? Uh, it's one, one of the major complaints that we hear about uptake of EVs is people are concerned that in places like northern Michigan, they're concerned they won't have access to an EV charger. And uh, certainly for folks driving uh, back and forth between uh, northern Michigan and southern Michigan, uh, Vanderbilt's a pretty good stopping point, and it would be a, uh, a good uh, selling point for local businesses. And I suspect that there are probably uh, entrepreneurs out there that are looking for places, uh, local markets, uh, local businesses, restaurants, uh, whatever, that could possibly have some space uh, to host uh, something like that. So that might be that might be one place to start. Um, I, I think uh, if you have uh, local uh, news media like a, a, a daily or weekly newspaper or something like that, uh, writing to them, uh, talking to the editor, uh, talking about some of the vulnerabilities that Northern Michigan has to climate change. Uh, is a good way to spark discussion. Uh, you may get some pushback, but that's fine. Uh, just if you, my my finding is, you know, you can disagree with people without being disagreeable. And still, even though as as harsh as our social media environment uh, sometimes seems, uh, if you actually meet with people face to face and you uh, are a sh straight shooter and you're fair with them, uh, you can have a discussion. And so those would be my suggestions. Great. Uh, so there's an, another question here. Um, uh, it's kind of a long one, but I've sort of uh, paraphrased it. Uh, there was a, a press conference this morning, or Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday morning, uh, followed up by committee testimony on HB 5120 to 5123, which drew out tensions between urban and rural communities, state and local control, and Michigan's present and future energy needs. So uh, uh, this, uh, Philip is thinking that these do not have unanimous support by Democrats. Is that true? That is true, uh, because uh, uh, a lot of the Democrats are, they are hearing from uh, these organized groups in uh, uh, the local uh, areas. The um, interesting thing is that the the groups uh, such as the Michigan Township Association, uh, as as a uh, as a uh, an organization, has come out against uh, these uh, these proposed laws. Uh, on the basis of local control. But uh, when I talk to individual uh, uh, township officials who recognize that this is a real uh, 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 
uh, divisive issue, they recognize that uh, they are not uh, qualified very often to uh, adequately uh, 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 evaluate some of these projects that are being brought to them. Uh, they would like to see some kind of uh, uh, state uh, intervention. And moreover, uh, if there is not some kind of change in the status quo, what's going to happen is that groups of farmers are already getting together and they are going to start firing off lawsuits and they're going to start uh, winning them because the ordinances that have been passed in many cases by some of these local townships uh, are in essence illegal and won't stand a judicial review. Uh, but we would like to avoid a, like a barroom legal shootout, uh, especially because so many of these local governments don't have the resources financially to, uh, to support and withstand uh, these kind of legal challenges. And so it's, it's incumbent on the state to, to step in and provide some kind of guidelines here because if they don't, uh, it's going to, a lot of communities are going to get hurt and the divisions that have already been opened up by these uh, bad actors will only get worse. So I would, I would, I would, uh, uh, I would, if you have a democratic representative or if you know a democratic representative, I would suggest you contact them and make your support known, at least for the general principle that some kind of uh, state uh, mediation is needed to to move these projects, which are so necessary, uh, uh, forward. Great. And the next question that we see uh, from Sheldon, he's asking, do you feel that the proposed clean energy plans currently being considered are significant enough for Michigan, or are there other further measures you'd like to see considered? Well, the... Uh, uh, Representative Iash's bills that were introduced today uh, deal mostly with the siting issue, which I think is a critical one and is deserving of everyone's support. There are uh, some other uh, proposals bouncing around there. Representative uh, Kofia had a bill for 100% uh, you, the definitions vary either 100% clean or 100% zero carbon uh, energy uh, by 2035 or 2040. I think if we can set some kind of uh, goal like that, I think that sends a strong message uh, to utilities uh, because utilities have to think in terms of 30 year time frames. So uh, whether, your, uh, whether your target is 2035 or 2040, the message is pretty strong for utilities to look elsewhere other than fossil fuels for their future generating capacity. And uh, some people will argue about the definition of uh, clean energy, which often will include things like nuclear versus uh, or, uh, zero carbon, excuse me, clean or zero carbon energy will often include nuclear uh, renewable energy usually means just solar and wind. Um, I don't think people should get too caught up in those definitions uh, because if we can, if we can take, if we can remove the barriers for clean energy now, uh, then we're going to see uh, just a, a, a big, big jump in the uptake of solar and wind, and those are going to be extremely extremely attractive and competitive in compared to any of the other alternatives. Uh, and uh, there is no, there is no uh, decarbonization uh, uh, future that does not include a whole lot of solar and wind, whether, whether or not nuclear ends up being a player uh, solar, we have to start building solar and wind because that's what we have right now. And, and it, it, we, are, we are behind and we need to get caught up. Great. Um, another question, uh, Mary asks, she's read about Green Mountain Power in Vermont proposing to install batteries in their customers' homes because of the horrendous damage caused by big storms. What do you think about that, Peter? 
Uh, well, it's a great idea. Uh, I think what uh, Green Mountain has been doing is over the last uh, several years, uh, they have been uh, introducing people to a program where they would get a uh, uh, some kind of a price break on a, uh, a home battery. They've been using Tesla power walls, but there's several different uh, flavors of battery. Uh, they get the home battery, and then the uh, utility uh, reserves the right to be able to tap into that battery in times of need, uh, never never leaving the homeowner without any charge, but just being able to use a certain percentage of power uh, in, in times when uh, you know the system was under a great deal of stress. That program has been very successful, and now they want to expand that because they say that uh, it's much cheaper to uh, give uh, uh, batteries to people, particularly in areas where there's a lot of vulnerability, a lot of blackouts, a lot of brownouts, uh, much cheaper than to build new or uh, revamp uh, existing transmission lines. So I, I think there's there's a lot of merit to that, uh, and and uh, I I think it might be something that we should consider in Michigan given the state of our our grid. But I'll add uh, that the price of batteries uh, is dropping so profoundly that uh, I think most utilities recognize that looking out five or ten years into the future. Uh, uh, most homeowners are going to, uh, the price is going to be in the range that most home, homeowners could start to uh, consider that as kind of a, not just uh, an emergency uh, backup for, a, say, a blackout situation, but also a form of uh, like energy investment where they could s store energy during the times of day when it is cheapest and then use that energy during the times of day when it's most expensive, which would be something that would cut into utilities uh, revenues quite a bit. And uh, that, would be, that would be something they would probably not like to get out of control. So it would behoove them to, to get ahead of that curve because the technology is gonna continue to get better and cheaper. And so they need to figure out some way to integrate that into their system so that they're not at loggerheads with their own customers on uh, energy storage. And uh, there was something else that uh, I was thinking, but uh, it's popped out of my head and I'll, I'll try to fish it out later in the conversation. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, you know, we, we have about 10 minutes left on this webinar and, and just a few questions left. So if you have any more, go ahead and uh, put them in the Q&A down at the bottom. Here's a question I have, uh, Peter. So we know that DTE has donated, there was an article recently in a newspaper where they, they revealed that DTE, DTE has given like serious money to, to, to legislators, the governor's reelection campaign. And right now they are actively pushing the legislature hard to water down this proposed clean energy future bill. How can people counter what the utilities are trying to do? Well, uh, the utilities are, uh, they're, it's important to understand the utilities are enormous organizations. They exist because our grandparents, in their wisdom, decided that rather than have uh, six different companies trying to build power lines all in the same community, it made more sense to have one regulated monopoly regulated by the public service commissioner, which is which is a commission appointed by the governor with relatively long term, so they're somewhat insulated from political uh, expediency. Uh, the utilities are operating under the set of in incentives that we authorize as, uh, as citizens. And so, uh, you know, we can, maybe think about ways that perhaps we could uh, limit the kind of political donations and influence that utilities have. Now, utilities, to be clear, they want to build more solar. 
They want to build more wind. Uh, they, what they don't want is to be uh, hemmed in by uh, uh, some of these target dates uh, uh, and uh, some of the uh, some of the more uh, ambitious uh, uh, clean energy goals that people have. Um, I think uh, historically. Uh, utilities, if you if you if you set the goal for them, they will rise to the occasion. Uh, the the only uh, pushback that we have uh, in the absence of, of changing the law and changing the incentives uh, that utilities operate by and their ability to make political contributions uh, is to uh, Push back ourselves uh, by letting our legislators know uh, how important it is to to deal with climate change, and that the, uh, they need to uh, uh, vote with that in mind. Um, the utilities are huge, powerful organizations, but they are also the uh, a very important. Uh, part of the apparatus that is going to build the clean energy grid that we need. So uh, we we have to we have to sort of look at them as as having you know uh, both both creative and and maybe not so creative uh, uh, aspects and uh, and deal with them uh, intelligently and and we hope encourage them encourage them on the good stuff and maybe push back a little bit on some of their excesses. Awesome. Uh, uh, Barb has a question. Uh, do you see any connections between right to repair legislation and clean energy legislation? I am not familiar with right to repair legislation. I don't know what that is. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, one last question, and I don't have time to get this on the screen, but Gwen is asking, rumor has it that for some time significant investors have removed from the fossil f or significant investors have removed from the fossil fuel industry and are placing their bets on renewables. Have you tracked this trend and, and will it cause the transition to happen in spite of political pushback? Well, there's a, a huge amount of investment going into uh, clean energy uh, without a doubt, but the uh, I think it's important to understand that the the just the, the concentration of power, not just here in Michigan or in the United States, but globally, that comes from the fossil fuel industry. I have a, a picture uh, that used to be my my desktop uh, picture of uh, Vladimir Putin shaking hands with Rex Tillerson. Rex Tillerson was the former chairman of Exxon Mobil, who later became Secretary of State uh, for Donald Trump, primarily because of the close relationship he had with Vladimir Putin. So if you look at the, the dynamics that are playing out politically across the globe right now, what we are seeing is the, uh, the fossil fuel industry represented by the Exxon Mobiles, but also by the Saudi, the Saudi uh, uh, family uh, uh, of Russia, which is a gigantic uh, uh, fossil fuel power. Their, their economy is almost entirely dependent on fossil fuels. So the, the massive uh, political uh, uh, movements that we see going on in the news every day in the background there is like a, a, a fossil fuel industry that is globally desperately trying to hang on to its power and uh so so yeah there's a lot of investment going on in clean energy but there's going to have to be an awful lot of engagement by ordinary people to uh to make sure that uh, we elect the right kind of, uh, uh, of uh, representatives that are going to be uh, uh, represent us against that power. And, and I'll just uh, 
I'll just put in a plug right here. I mean, do not be misled by uh, any of these uh, like uh, uh, supposedly morally pure third party crusades or anything like this. Your choice uh, if you want to vote for people that uh, know about and care about uh, your children's future, you, you're really you have to vote for a Democratic candidate. And I'm not a Democrat. Uh, I'm just saying that this is this is reality right now. Uh, the Republican Party is completely captured by the fossil fuel industry, has been for decades, and is uh, uh, this is probably uh, it would appear that they've decided that uh, rather than lose power, they're ready to sacrifice our constitution and our democracy. And so we're at, a, at an existential moment and going into a, a critical, critical election year that I hope everybody will be engaged in, but be very, very clear eyed and uh, don't be uh, don't be misled uh, uh, and recognize uh, who your allies truly are. is what I would say. All right. Thanks, Peter. Uh, you know, we have time for one last question, if, you, if we can answer it quickly. Uh, this is from Stephen. He asks, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act has been introduced by a rep in California. This approach would reduce fossil fuel use. So what support have you seen for this type of carbon tax here in Michigan? Well, I, I don't see, I have not heard anybody uh, talk about a carbon tax here in Michigan. If, if that, I'm not familiar with that particular act, but if that's what it is, carbon tax, um, you get a lot of lip service from people talking about a carbon tax. Uh, it's a great idea, but the simple fact is that no Republican is going to vote for anything that says tax in the title. And so um, it's it's always been a little bit of a non-starter, even though it is technically the most conservative market-based way to deal with uh, any kind of pollution, uh, including uh, carbon pollution. So if somebody were to introduce something like that, I'd be all for it. But I don't see, I don't see anything, uh, I'm not aware of anything in the Michigan legislature that's moving in that direction. Mm, got it. All right, well, very good. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, we have uh, we've had a real good turnout, and I think a lot of good questions. I uh, hope we answer them for you. Um, we appreciate you joining us, and uh, I just want to let you know that we will be posting this uh, webinar live. I'm sorry, uh, the recording on nemiac.org. Uh, it'll be on YouTube, but it'll it'll you can find it by just visiting nemiac.org to uh, see a replay and share it with anybody that maybe have missed it or if there's anything you want to go back and review. So uh, thanks very much, everyone, for joining. Uh, uh, once again, I'm Bill Latka up here in the corner. Thanks to Peter. Uh, golf claps for Peter. Fantastic information. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Bill. Thanks, everybody.